The Great Lakes hold 21% of the world's surface fresh water and host habitat for a variety of economically and environmentally important fish and wildlife species. The lakes collectively provide drinking water for more than 40 million people and serve as a regional economic powerhouse for commerce, tourism, and recreation. People come fishing here, motels, hotels, gas stations, marinas, everybody is full because of the fishing. If you didn't have the fishing, you didn't have none of that. Any pollutant, any new species, it's a big concern. The Great Lakes region is also a major agricultural area, with producers utilizing more than 55 million acres to support America's food systems. However, the many demands placed on the Great Lakes have impacted their health and resiliency. To protect and restore this great natural resource, federal, state, and private partners have joined forces to innovate and implement effective solutions. The U.S. Department of Agriculture plays a vital role in these efforts to improve the region. USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service, or NRCS, works with private landowners to improve soil and water resources in one of the Great Lakes' priority watersheds, the Western Lake Erie Basin. The NRCS has partnered with USDA's Agricultural Research Service, universities, and others on the Conservation Effects Assessment Project, or SEEP, to assess and improve the outcomes of conservation practices on soil and water quality. SEEP scientists partner with local farmers to study how conservation practices work and strive to innovate practices to make them more effective. In the Great Lakes region, they conduct edge-of-field and small watershed research that focuses on monitoring, understanding, and reducing agricultural nutrient losses to improve the health of Lake Erie's watersheds. So we study how water and nutrients move through the soil profile, um, how rainfall amount and rainfall intensity and soil moisture influence when and how water and nutrients move through the landscape. So the, we started monitoring up here in 2002, um, and we've been monitoring ever since. We started out with just a handful of sites on a few uh, agricultural ditches, but we've moved into um, several paired edge of field sites along with the ditches. So um, it gives us a, ref a point of reference, a way to compare. So there's no two fields that are the same. From a typical field, there's two main flow pathways for water to reach a ditch. It can either flow over the surface, and that's called surface runoff or overland flow. Water can also infiltrate down in through the soil profile and make it to the tile drains, which will also ultimately make it to the drainage ditch. Well, we collect um, weather data, which is rain, wind speed, wind direction, um, humidity, barometric pressure, temperature. Uh, we also have soil moisture and soil temperature at various depths at all of our sites. We have sites that are monitoring subsurface flow, surface runoff from fields. Automatic samplers are round. They hold 24 bottles. And the sampler knows where each bottle is. In this site here, uh, we have, it's a two-stage program to see what happens in low flow as well as in high flow. High flow is when we have most of the losses. So we try to take more samples during an event. So one of the primary uses of our water quality data that we collect here is, is developing and improving models. So the data we collect go into developing equations or ways to predict um, what would be happening on fields that we don't monitor. So we share our data with a lot of, of partner organizations, including NRCS, um, farmer organizations, commodity groups, um, just so that you know, they know that we're collecting real on-farm data. These aren't model results. Um, this is data that's on a working farm. These are privately owned fields. Um, this is you know, agriculture as agriculture exists in the real world. These researchers have teamed up with local farmer Kevin Bowman to study the impact of one conservation practice developed and evaluated under C, the blind inlet. This innovative drainage system removes sediment and phosphorus at the edge of fields, filtering the water before it enters nearby waterways. I'm Kevin Bowman. Uh, we have a run under the farm name Bowman & Bowman Farms, Inc. And, uh, 
We're here in DeKalb County. We're up by Waterloo, and we're a commercial grain farm. My family, the, the Bowman family, came, came and settled in DeKalb County in the 1840s and they've been farming ever since. That is a land grant. When they were dividing up the county into parcels, people came out from the east and got parcels from the government. That is the original deed, you'd say, and it came from Martin Van Buren in 1840. We always have liked to try new things and different things uh, to, to make ourselves more efficient and still be good stewards of the land and improve our stuff. And that, that's how we got in working with the ARS and NRCS. So a blind inlet is a best management practice that's designed to remove sediment from overland flow. They're built in depressions in fields, and so these depressions generally become flooded at certain times of the year, and it makes it uh, difficult or impossible to do different agricultural operations. The purpose of it is to drain the depression, but with the additional benefit of filtering out the sediment. And this is the reason why the producers like it, is because you can farm directly over it. They don't have to drive around that riser pipe anymore. With help from Kevin Bowman, the seep scientist improved the blind inlet and invented another conservation practice known as a phosphorus removal structure. It specifically filters out dissolved forms of phosphorus. The practice has since been adopted across the region. My father and I, we would work with the local ARS guys. That evolved till, till they came up with a concept and it's still working today. Pretty soon they came out with some funding ideas. Actually in the county, several people took advantage of it. It's important to be able to remove dissolved phosphorus because the dissolved phosphorus is 100% bioavailable to your aquatic ecosystems. With a particulate bound phosphorus, its bioavailability will vary appreciably depending on the conditions. There's a blind inlet there that filters out the sediment and then that drainage water feeds into the tile drain system for that field, which then flows into the buried pea removal structure to remove the dissolved phosphorus and scrub the rest of it. This tank specifically is a mixture of steel metal shavings with gravel. So we get good flow of water through it, and that steel, as it rusts, it produces iron oxide, which can remove phosphorus. So You've got your high dissolved pea water coming in on one end, distributed at the bottom, flows up through the media, it's retained by the media, and then the clean water goes out on the other end. All right, and the filter media, in this case, it's a byproduct that's uh, relatively inexpensive. What we're finding is cost per pound of pea removal is, is, is uh, one of the best ones. We can design these structures to last for different amounts of time, to remove varying amounts of uh, varying loads of phosphorus. Um, it's an engineered unit and we've, we've created software that people can use to custom design it for your site. I think that's part of that, just continually striving to, to do a better job in an efficient way. Information is still a good thing and I, and I feel like if you're more open with people, they're more open and fair to you. And, and in turn, if they come in with new ideas, if they have an idea, well, let's try this and we'll help you do it, get started. You know, I want to leave this better than we got it. Uh, and I, I think, you know, most everyone in America does. SEAT brings researchers' creativity and landowners' stewardship together to develop new conservation practices and ensure they're scientifically proven to be effective. USDA works with partners such as demonstration farms to showcase these practices and encourage their broader adoption. The Proving Ground Farm, run by the Seneca Conservation District, is open to the public and holds educational events to communicate economical and environmentally impactful best management practices, or BMPs. Here at the farm, we have BMPs installed. We have waterways, we do diverse cover crop mixes. We have many practices that the farmers can actually come out and see before they decide if it's an investment that's gonna work on the management system in their farm. So it kind of takes that risk away from them where they can kind of see it in action, see a little bit of our data before they make the decision on how they wanna change or what they wanna change in their farm. We like to try new practices. The practices that we have out here on the land constantly change um, with what's new and what's working. There is no one magic filtering system any 
anywhere in this world that can take all of the things out of water. Um, but with different chemistries and different biologies involved, we can remove lots of different things in that treatment train. So we stack practices. Um, we also consider train um, treatments. And so behind me is a cascading waterway um, that collects all of the nutrients and all of the water from the field. Water over the cascade slowly goes through a grass strip and a filter strip and it eventually ends up in a pool of water, the nutrient removal wetland here. And each of those stages does something different to the water and helps treat it before then it's discharged into the creek. And so with a little thinking and a little bit of strategic planning with a technical advisor or a conservation professional, um, we can often make things fit onto your farms. And, and in a demonstration farm, we can show how we've done that. Seep scientist, Dr. Kevin King, is collecting data from edge of field water quality research stations to see the impact of the Proving Ground Farm's layered conservation practice approach, including nutrient management, cover crop, no-till, erosion control, and other practices. So our edge of field network was established, really it goes back to the formation of SEEP. Currently, uh, we have roughly 20 paired edge of field sites that are located in three primary watersheds. So we're located uh, in the upper Scioto uh, watershed, uh, the upper Wabash, and then the Lake Erie uh, Basin. Collectively, we've got something like 450 site years of data across those sites which we feel like those sites are representative of, of the different uh, management practices within the state, the different types of ro crop rotations and the different types of soils. So we're really actually going into the farmer's field. We're wanting to understand what the impact of a specific practice is on the water quality, both the surface runoff and the tile drainage associated with that. So we're very fortunate that the farmers have opened up their lands to us, they're sharing their management records with us uh, to, to get that type of data. The big three, I think, are uh, getting the nutrients in contact with the soil. So whether that's uh, subsurface placement, whether that's a light tillage of, of the practices, uh, that would be number one. Uh, number two is disconnecting the hydrologic pathways. The nutrients move with water. If we can keep the water stored in the field, and we can do that some with drainage water management, that's where we artificially raise the outlet elevations of a tile. Uh, that keeps more water in the field. And then finally, as we do that though, so we want to make sure that we don't increase or potentially increase erosion uh, during these types of practices. You know, we're, we're still in our infancy in terms of data. Yes, we've got a, a few years of data, but again, we need longer term data sets to really to, to say concretely what the impacts are. As, as we're moving, everybody wants that silver bullet. And, and unfortunately, uh, we're, there is no silver bullet. It's, it's probably more like a silver buckshot. We're gonna have to have a lot of different practices uh, stacking on top of one another. SEEP studies directly inform NRCS programs, practices, and planning. SEEP determines how comprehensive science-based solutions can be strategically placed on the landscape where they can deliver the greatest water quality benefits. NRCS provides technical and financial assistance to landowners to develop and implement effective conservation plans. A bulk of my job is to work with landowners to solve resource concerns through the different conservation practices that we offer. We meet on site with the landowners, see what their issues are, maybe identify some things that they haven't seen that may be some resource concerns they'd want to address, uh, determine what practices on the landscape uh, may fit to help alleviate those resource concerns. So when, when we talk about soil health, we're talking about resiliency, and, and that encompasses a lot of things. One of those is the ability to store more water on the landscape. We have a variety of programs from uh, working lands programs to easement programs designed to provide financial assistance to producers to implement conservation practices based on the resource concerns identified on the landscape. I'm fortunate to work in a county where the Agricultural Research Service is doing a lot of ongoing data collection and studies on different conservation practices. I think it's critical for us to continue 
working with landowners to not only improve water quality, soil erosion, soil health, but I think it'll also in the long run improve the economics of farming operations. In seep watershed studies, edge of field monitoring documents the more immediate impacts of conservation practices on water quality. While small watershed research in streams help scientists understand how multiple conservation practices are improving water quality on a broad scale. At Heidelberg University, Dr. Laura Johnson's team collects and tests water samples to measure the amounts of sediment, phosphorus, and nitrogen in ditches and streams flowing into Lake Erie's western basin. Our mission is basically, we're trying to figure out how we can both maintain healthy ecosystems and use them at the same time. Most recently, we've taken on a paired watershed study with the, in the Blanchard River and the headwaters of the Maumee, where we're going to take on more of a control and treatment approach. We have paired watersheds where in the treatment, we're going to try and stack and fill it with all of the practices that we think are going to work best for phosphorus. Our data is used very heavily with the whole community of watershed modelers that they're used as what's called the SWAP model, the Soil and Water Assessment Tool. And there's been multiple groups that have been using these SWAP models basically to try to figure out, well, how many practices do we need to, to have in order to reduce phosphorus and nitrogen down to levels that would reduce the, the potential for blooms in Lake Erie. Uh, we've been collecting data there since 1974. One of the most recent changes that we've seen in the late 90s to the early 2000s was a big increase in dissolved phosphorus. It's like the sugar of the phosphorus world that's making it into Lake Erie. Um, around that time in the early 2000s, NOAA I was able to start using satellite imagery to assess the bloom intensity and coverage, and they've been able to start to put a number to that. And then working together, we've developed this relationship. We play a key role in trying to understand what's coming from the land and making it into the lake, but there's only so much that one small organization can do. We really have to partner with our federal, um, you know, with our federal partners that are be able to look at what's actually coming off the land. Um, looking at what should be implemented to reduce nutrient runoff from agricultural or urban areas. But really the other key side of thing is we have a lot of university collaborators that are out on Lake Erie actually collecting this data in real time as well to verify that what the satellite's seeing, what we're observing is all, you know, actually occurring. Our data tells us it basically reflects what's happening on the land. So any, any decision that's being made, whether it's with agriculture or urbanization, it can tell us like if that practice is working, if something's happening that's maybe unintended that, that has been occurring recently, it can reflect the potential effects of future climates, scenarios, you know, what, it, what might we better expect to see in the future if we have more intense, um, you know, different types of rain events or precipitation events. Over time, by using seep science collected on farms, we can inform the design of more effective practices on private agricultural lands to reduce nutrient and sediment losses from watersheds. Ultimately, we're all working together to do our part to protect and restore Lake Erie for future generations.